welcome to Rewildology, the show that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Today's episode is special for more than one reason. Not only is it the first episode of 2022, but it is also part one of the Costa Rica Life, Lava, and Forest series. In November 2021, I traveled to Costa Rica to experience the country's incredible biodiversity and gain firsthand knowledge about the issues that conservationists are facing because, as we all know, protecting wild places is not easy. In this series, you'll hear experts from Costa Rica and all over the world share their knowledge about various charismatic species such as sea turtles, humpback whales, and jaguars. You'll also hear discussions about the darker side of conservation in Central America, like the illegal wildlife trade, poaching, murder, plastic pollution, and being a woman leader in a male-dominated society. But don't worry, in true Rewatology fashion, there's also lots of laughing, cursing, and drinking. We leave no stones unturned in this series, and I promise you're going to learn a ton from every guest. We're starting this series with a bang and chatting about a predator that you might associate more with Brazil than Costa Rica, jaguars. Yes, jaguars. The Western Hemisphere's largest cat resides in the rainforest of Costa Rica and plays a vital role in maintaining ecosystem balance. But don't just take my word. For today's guest, Juan Carlos Cruz has spent the past 12 years studying this beautiful and elusive cat. We chat all things jaguars, such as their relation to the more famous jaguar populations in South America, jaguars versus pumas, or mountain lions, depending on where you're at, and the difference between their ecological roles, the relationship between jaguars and sea turtles, and how Juan is working diligently to conserve these cats by co-founding Nama Conservation, a nonprofit dedicated to protecting jaguar habitat by working with local communities. If you're liking the show, don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to be alerted when the next episode of this series drops. Also, share this episode on your Instagram story with your favorite takeaway and tag Rewildology. You can also now rate the show on Spotify, so if that is your preferred listening method, drop us up to a five-star review and help others find the podcast. All right, everyone, here is my conversation with Juan. Well, hi, Juan. Thank you so much for coming on Rewildology today. We are going to have so much fun talking about one of my favorite species, and of course, in a very different way, in a very different ecosystem that I don't think many people know much about. So this is, oh yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun today. But before we get to jaguars and Costa Rica and all of your incredible work, let's go back to one as a kid. Tell me, where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? And how in the world did you get to Costa Rica from where you grew up, which wasn't Costa Rica? So yeah, tell me your whole journey. How did you get here? Yeah, well, it's been a long journey. As you said, I'm originally from Mexico. This is uh, where I was born. This is where I grew up. And since I was a kid, I was really in touch with nature. And my parent, my family actually took me on vacation to the beach and, you know, to the forest and so on. So I had family actually that lived in the coast of Mexico and they were like, you know, they had properties with forests and stuff. So as a kid, I spent a lot of time in the forest looking at nature. So I, I kind of grew up loving this. Later on, I started to watch on TV these nature documentaries like, you know, like this big, big beautiful nature documentaries. And I was like, oh my God, I want to be like those guys. You know, I want to, I want to do that. You know, but when, then I grew up and uh, I never thought that I could do that for a living because I thought it was, you know, like just for a few. And then when I started studying biology, I realized that I was probably not on TV, but I was going to be able to do it. it the only <laughs> yeah. difference is that I was not going to be on TV. But uh, so, yeah, that's what I, uh, I think that's what I got my, my love for nature, my interest for nature since I was a kid. Oh, wonderful. So how in the world did you go from Mexico to Costa Rica? I mean, that's not like, a, it's not a hop, a skip away. I mean, <laughs> it is a little bit of a distance. And so why in the world did you go to Costa Rica? 
Yeah, and so I studied biology in Mexico. I graduated and I worked for a couple of years in there. And then I was looking for a master's degree in conservation and wildlife management. And back in the day, there were not many programs specifically on this. So I did a search and one of the most renowned institute was in Costa Rica. It, it's a very small institute and they take up to 10 students per year. So it was really hard wow. to get in. And I got a scholarship also for that. So I, I didn't think about it. I didn't even think about it. Just moved to Costa Rica. And my idea was to go just to study, to take classes in there and then go back to Mexico and fulfill my, my research in there. But you know, one thing led to another. And after 12 years, I'm still here in the rainforest <laughs> of Costa Rica. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> so why Jaguars? Where did that come about? So since I was studying biology, my interest was mammals. I wanted to, to dive into the mammal world and to do research. And actually I worked with bats and pretty much medium, small, big, pretty much all the terrestrial mammals. But when I got into Costa Rica, I, one of my professors in the master's was Eduardo Carrillo, who is the expert of jaguars in Central America and Costa Rica. So he's, he's guilty for uh, leading me into the jaguar path because he started to take me as a volunteer to national parks to work with jaguars specifically, you know, about ecology, about conservation. And I, that's what I really uh, got interested in that topic because I never believed I was going to be able to work directly with jaguars, but there I was, you know, face to face with one of the leaders of, of jaguar ecology and conservation. So I was like, sure, I'm going to go for it. And he's been my mentor. He's been pretty much teaching me all, all that I know so far. When did you meet him? I met him in 2009. Oh, nice. And so you're like, I'm not letting you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're mine. I'm holding on to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so great. But before we dive really deep into Jaguars, I, I kind of wanted to ask a question before we move too far away from Mexico. So in this field, it is very natural for a lot of people to have to leave from wherever their home country is to go to somewhere else. And while that can be super fun, and there's also, I mean, there's obviously a lot of perks to this, sometimes that can be really hard. So what it has been like for you to be away for 12 years? I mean, do sometimes you regret it or sometimes do you want to go back home or have you dealt with much personal struggle being in a different country for a long time? Or what has that been like for you? Oh, I miss Mexican food so much. <laughs> You cannot believe that actually, you know, I I could barely cook when I moved to Costa Rica because, you know, you don't realize as a Mexican how good the food is until you are in a foreign place. And then I'm like, okay, I, I, I was craving for a lot of things, for everything. So I started cooking. Uh, of course, it was difficult. I left everything behind. You know, when I when I left Mexico, I didn't know I was not going to come back. So I left everything, my family, my friends, my job, everything in there. And as I said, it was not my idea to stay here. I didn't know that. But once I settled down here and I started to work with Jaguar, of course, I made new friends. I made new colleagues. I started to create new uh, collaborations. And now my whole life is here. You know, I'm a very intricate relation with institution, uh, researchers, colleagues, friends, you know, everything in here. Did your family have a hard time at first? I think so. I think so. They were always expecting me to come back eventually. Uh, but, you know, as I said, even me, I didn't know I was not going to come back. And that was not a plan. It's still not a plan. Every time, you know, once in a while, my family or friends or someone asked me like, hey, are you ever coming back? And I'm like, maybe, you know, because I'm never <laughs> planning to stay. It just happens. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so funny. They're like, we don't believe you anymore. Exactly. exactly. We just don't believe you. When you pack your bags and show up on the plane, then I'll believe you. <laughs> Exactly. And, and I, I mean, it's not that I don't come back. I visit Mexico and my family and my friends like three, four times a year. It's not like I never go back. It's just that I work here now. Hmm. Oh, that's nice. So you are able to come home quite oh, often yeah. then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like every two to three years or something one time. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I go like really like three, four times a year. Like it's really easy now, you know, like convenient and short distance and it's just yeah oh good good and i can definitely see that about the food 
I mean, I absolutely loved the Costa Rican food, but there was no spice whatsoever. I was kind of surprised about that. And you're probably like, this is weak sauce <laughs> coming from Mexico. <laughs> it's true. It's hard to find really good hot sauces in here. Now I make them myself. <laughs> yeah, we even went to this really tasty Thai place and we got the hot. And you know, Thai is notoriously like yeah. painfully hot. And mm -hmm. the hot was barely, I don't know, yeah. mild. Yeah. And <laughs> it was it was quite impressive. I was like, oh my gosh, this is funny. This is so funny. Um, okay, okay, we can get back to cats now. But thanks for exploring that with me because I have met, and a lot of people on the podcast have been from different countries and they're working in a completely foreign place. And everyone has seemed to take in that a little differently. But it yes. sounds like you've been able to go home quite a lot, which I'm sure helps with any type of, you know, homesickness or anything, which mm -hmm. that's awesome. That's good. That's good. So let, let's get back to Jaguars here. So how are Jaguars different in Costa Rica versus other populations? Like, you know, a lot of us think of the National Geographic or BBC footage of the Jaguars and the Pantanal and they're hunting the Cayman and all this kind of stuff. Now, this ecosystem in Costa Rica is obviously very different. So start telling me more about these specific jaguars. Where can they be found? And do they have any differences than their other relatives in South America? But please educate us. All things jaguars. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. So back in the 90s, probably the early 2000s, uh, researchers used to think there were like different subspecies of jaguar in the continent, but recent studies have shown that there is not significant difference among these. So it means that all over from Mexico or South United States, all the way down to Argentina, we have the same species of jaguar. That means that a Mexican jaguar will be able to reproduce with a Brazilian jaguar and, uh, you know, like have offspring normally. Of course, we have to make sure that the gene pool is as diverse as possible. So this is why it's important that all these different population of jaguars are connected. So in an ideal world, the population of Mexico will have to be connected with the population in the South and so on until there is connection to the very South population. So whenever there is a disruption in connectivity, that's what the problems, because their genetic pool is not as, as, as varied as it should be and so on, but it's the same species. Now, in terms of connectivity, Costa Rica, as you can see, I mean, the whole Central America, but Costa Rica in particular is very narrow. So it's a bridge really between the North and the South and whole Central America. So it's very important to work in these populations because if we don't take care of these, then the population of Jaguars from North America would be isolated from the ones in South America. This is why the importance of it. And uh, you're right. So people try to think about Jaguars with Pantanal or you know even Mexico or even the Amazon. But we have Jaguars in 18 countries from Mexico to Argentina. So it's a very huge distribution that this species has. And do they have any different behaviors or anything? Or are Jaguars just Jaguars? Jaguars are Jaguars everywhere. <laughs> they are the top predators in our ecosystems in the whole continent. They're the biggest predators. And so they take on more than 80 species. It's been documented that they have more than 80 species as a prey. Uh, as prey uh, all over the distribution, but they have some preference over the bigger species like wild lip peccary. So the wild lip peccary would be the main prey of them from Mexico to Argentina. But of course they take on uh, opportunities as well. So they are known to prey on caimans in Pantanal. In here also we have documented that they prey on caimans, crocodiles, sea turtles, a big number of species. So jaguar is a jaguar everywhere. <laughs> That's Awesome. That's awesome. And when we chatted last, you mentioned that jaguars are an indicator species for ecosystem health. Could you elaborate on this a little bit more? I would love to hear your take on why this is. Yeah, absolutely. As I said, uh, jaguars are the top predators in the ecosystem. That means that they play a crucial role as regulators of the trophic web. They prey upon a variety of herbivores in this case, like peccaries or deers or, ta or tapirs as their main prey, which at the same time make an effect controlling the biomass production of thousands of plants in the forest because they eat from them. 
So if we remove the jaguars from the ecosystem, we will have like an explosion of herbivores, which at the same time will have to feed on more plant and biomass, and then the whole ecosystem collapses. That is the importance of having a jaguar in the ecosystem. Mm, that's great. And so another big cat is there, you know, the puma, the cougar, the mountain lion, catamount, all the same cat, which is amazing. But it doesn't fill the same ecological niche or has the same role. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Because we, we chatted about this last time we talked, like, what is the difference between these cats? Why, when you see a lot of pumas, it's, it's not a good sign for you. So I would love, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, so pumas are also another predator, but it's not as big as the jaguar. So it would be like the second biggest predator in our ecosystems. And I know sometimes like in the States or Canada or even Patagonia, pumas can be huge, you know, can be, but in really in the middle from Mexico to Argentina, pumas are smaller than jaguars. And actually when a jaguar is present, pumas are in lower abundances than, than the jaguars because the jaguars are the biggest, the strongest, and so they're the boss. <laughs> so the pumas have to go back a little bit and stay behind the line. And so this is why it's an indicator of uh, balance of the ecosystem because when you come to a forest and you don't find many jaguars or no jaguars at all, but you find pumas or a lot of pumas, it's, it's a bad sign for the ecosystem, for the health of the ecosystem, because that means that the pumas are taking the gaps in the ecosystem that the jaguars are leaving behind. So when there is not enough uh, natural prey for jaguars or their conflict on their, or they're being hunted and they are out of the ecosystem, the pumas will take and fill those gaps. And so whenever you find a place with a lot of pumas, but not many jaguars, that's not a good sign. That's actually a bad sign of the health of the ecosystem. The ecosystem is not in balance. Have you seen that a lot? And if you have, what is maybe an example of turning that around? Yeah, so in Costa Rica it's interesting because we have two examples of these two different poles. So in Guanacaste conservation area, we have an area that used to be 50 years ago, just remnants of dry forest with the majority of land used for livestock production. So now it's a national park, it's a protected area. It's actually three national parks. But now you can see like the biggest and more healthy, the most healthiest population of jaguars in the country. We have many, many jaguars because the forest came back and because the forest came back, the herbivores came back. And so jaguars have enough prey to thrive. In the other hand, we have the Osa Peninsula, which is, which is rainforest. And we have a big problem with hunting. People are still hunting peccaries, wildly peccaries which is the main prey of jaguar. And because this low number on their main prey, the abundance of jaguar is also going down as well. So in one country, we have two examples of one place that is thriving and one place that is still going down in their abundances. Mm. So I know you have this amazing organization called Nama Conservation. As you're seeing this, how are all of you tackling this big issue? Because I'm sure it's, it feels one really exciting to see a thriving jaguar population and then at the same time to see another one that isn't doing so well so how, how are you guys going about this and hopefully helping the one that's decreasing a lot mm -hmm. well Guanacaste is doing so well right now because there have been people and researchers doing great conservation efforts since the 80s so Daniel Jansen, who's, who's one of the leaders who started this restoration, ecological restoration project, they were restore, restoring the forest in order to have the characteristics allowed to herbivores to come back and so on. And also they were working with education. They have many, many years educating communities and working with them, plus being really effective against hunting. So we tried to replicate these ideas into the Osa Peninsula. And so we're trying to work with the authorities in order to or have better strategies against hunting and poaching, try to educate the people and keep doing research on a daily basis. So we actually monitor the population specifically. Uh, one of the important things in the Osa Peninsula Nama Conservation is trying to do is work with the communities. The local communities now, they're taking the lead in order to do conservation efforts. They are not just doing more biological monitoring, but are protecting the groups of wildly peccary against poachers. So in our organization, we're supporting them 
because sometimes they don't have enough money to cover travel expenses, to travel fuel, you know, all these different equipment even. So we're trying to give them what they need in order to uh, do keep doing these conservation efforts. And before, did you see a lot of conflict with local communities and Jaguars? Are they coming to you or how is this relationship with communities fostered and started? So, you know, some communities are leaders in doing conservation right now, but it was not always like this. Uh, There is one community in particular that uh, we work with and they are becoming right now one of the best conservationists because they don't not only realize about the importance of having these species in their lives, but they see an opportunity for them also to have an income. So there is a lot of ecotourism in there. And if you are a nature guide, but not only that, if you're an expert in getting to know the area and be good at spotting species like this, you can bring people in order to appreciate ecosystem, species in particular, and then you can get an income from this. So the appreciation of nature has changed through time. And now they know that a uh, living peccary works more than a dead peccary. Because a dead peccary, as a poacher, they can feed you probably for a week. And if you sell the meat, they can give you like some dollars. But if you have and take care and protect this living peccary, you can show them to tourists, you can make an, a, a living out of it. And you, know, you can have a benefit, an economic benefit from it in the long term. Oh my gosh, that's great. <laughs> that's great. And has there been any Jaguar tourism able to develop at all? Or are they just still too elusive where that's not really a thing? <laughs> yeah, in Costa Rica, it's still, I mean, depends on the area. So Pantanal, for example, is like the greatest example of Jaguar ecotourism, but it's a different characteristics. Pantanal, uh, you can reach them by the channels, you know, by the rivers and so on. So it's a different landscape is a totally different ecosystem but not necessarily you have to see them directly there is many ways of doing that we have camera traps we have you know different different types of ways of knowing that a job is present in that this is why we rely on this technology because such cryptic and elusive species like this sometimes camera traps is the only way to know that they are in there but um, if you merge these with other species like the peccaries or you know, other species of terrestrial mammals, it makes like a whole experience in order to go there and see the, the rest of the ecosystem as a whole. Totally agree. When we saw our first peccaries, I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like I, I didn't realize how many I was going to see. I probably wouldn't have been near as excited if I realized how many I was going to see. But like, <laughs> <laughs> it was so exciting because I was tracking them because I love okay. to track. And mm-hmm. I was checking a jaguarundi. And I was like, oh, where's this cat going? I, I didn't find it. But I was really wow. excited because I tracked it. And, yes. then I, I was, and then I saw some peccary poop. And I'm like, oh, it was right here. And then I was like following its tracks. And, and then I don't know. I came up on like a pretty big little herd of them. Oh, and wow. I was like, oh, okay. And then I saw them, like, I don't know, like, I don't know how many more times, but it was really exciting though, because I'm like, oh, your cat food, your predator food. <laughs> and I'm seeing you everywhere. This is yes. awesome. Yes. So yeah, being a predator lover, I'm as you are as well, the more food you see, the more excited I get. Cause I'm just like, oh, that means that you can host a whole population of my favorite cat, you know? <laughs> exactly. That's the whole idea. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's get, let's dive a little bit more into NAMA right now. One thing that I absolutely love about your organization is how much you value local community knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's, it almost feels like it's one of your pillars. So let's talk a little bit more about that. How do you engage on a deeper level with local communities and and respect their knowledge. And like, let's say that you're starting a new project for the first time in an area that you haven't worked before. What is the strategy that you take to engage local communities in this work? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, when we come to a community and we want to work in there because there is like an interest because of Jaguar or something else, you have to reach the locals because they know the territory. They know the area better than anyone. And I mean, you can spend a year trying to get to know the area by yourself, but they're right there. They were born in there, you know, it's their territory. And if you tell them and explain to them what you want to do, 
they would be interested in that, especially if there is a community with the potential of doing ecotourism or doing all of these examples that I just uh, mentioned. And so really quick examples of this is that uh, sometimes we work with local uh, nature guides and the nature guides know the places where these animals are because that's what they do for a living. They show these animals to the people. So instead of coming here or to a place and you know, place the cameras where you think it's gonna be the best, just go and ask them, you know, you go and ask the locals where is the best place. So in Nama, we appreciate this knowledge. And it's also very, they engage better with, with the projects when locals are included into this, you know, because it's, 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 it's very valuable information that they have. Also, when you need to start to do some tracking, for example, to um, get some data for calculate abundance and everything, they are the best trackers. You don't need to teach them the difference between a print of a jaguar versus a, a puma. They know it right away. So all of these, you know, skills and opportunities, you have to, as researcher and conservationists, we have to take them into uh, consideration and include them in any conservation project. And so let's say that you've collected all this data now and you have some sort of research conclusion, then how do you share that knowledge with the local community after that? Mm -hmm. Well, we're working on it right now, and uh, there are two there are two different ways to do that. So, since locals are involved now in monitoring these species, we often show them how to process this information in order for them to not just understand that, but they can do it themselves. And if we can achieve this, so they can have the whole process, like setting the camera traps, download the information and interpret the information. That would be like the best thing to do. And of course, there are some analyses that take like, they're more complicated and, you know, like for scientific publications and so on. But this is really the integration of locals in all the steps, as many steps as possible to do the research is what makes a difference. And this is what we're trying to do. As NAMA, we actually are giving training to community rangers in order not only, as I said, to do the monitoring well, but only to be able to interpret the results and to have a better idea what's going on in comparison, like the result compared to what they do. I mean, the, what, what the, the activities that they do for monitoring and the result and how they both are connected. Oh, that is fantastic. I love, I, I feel, and, t and tell me if you feel the same way, I feel like there is this new wave of conservation and amazing conservation organizations like NAMA where it is so inclusive, where it's not some NGO, some foreign NGO coming into an area and being like, okay, we're setting up shop here and we're just gonna do research on your land, take our data and go which is the classic standard way of doing conservation research or wildlife research in any way. And I feel that what NAMA has put together is almost becoming the standard. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done, of course, but I feel that NAMA is just such a great example of what we can do when we do it the right way. And when we have all these local voices and involving local indigenous communities and everything like that. Are you seeing similar things in Costa Rica or is NAMA really heading this new way of doing conservation or what are you, what are you seeing on the ground? Yes, I think we still have this really old fashioned idea of doing conservation as you just mentioned, like, you know, like this big organization that comes to one place and then just tell everyone what to do. We wanted to do it differently. And actually, uh, we say among us that we do conservation from local to global, instead of normally what they say from global to local. We start to make the baseline of our conservation projects, including the local communities, including the local knowledge, because if they, are, if they don't agree with what we're doing, we won't go anywhere. So we, all of us, all of the stakeholders have to be synced in order to uh, you know, work together because conservation is not a work for one organization, it's not the work of the government, it's not the work of you and me, it's a work of everyone. And if, not, if, if all the stakeholders are not synced together, this will of conservation does not move. So we know that we're trying to change that, but it's exactly like you said. 
Uh, it's a new view. It's a new strategy, and we're trying, and it's working well. Have you gotten any pushback from any other organizations? Well, you know, I think in general, everyone in the world is realizing that local communities and local knowledge is important. So I think, as you said, it's a global movement. But, you know, since the system, it is built to work from up to down, uh, sometimes it's difficult to try to understand why we need, you know, to find funding to pay some locals in order to do that. You know, normally that's not in the mind of the big organizations. Fortunately, we have partnered with some NGOs that were exactly like us. They, mm. they believe in local knowledge, they believe in traditional knowledge, and they go conservation from down to up. Oh, that's great. I'm sure you're just like, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> when you started to work with them. And I, I have to ask this too. Why did NAMA come about? There's also this big balance that us in conservation have to weigh is do I start something myself mm -hmm. and go down that really stressful path, but make the impact I know I want to make versus joining an organization that already exists and mm -hmm. putting all your efforts into, you know, helping whatever that mission is, that organization. So why did you and whoever else that was with you start NAMA Conservation? Why did you go down that route? Yeah, you, you just said it right. Uh, before we started NAMA, we were just a group of friends who are researchers, Jaguar researchers, most of us are Jaguar researchers. And we were, of course, worried about the status of Jaguar in certain uh, areas, you know, problems, hunting. And we were like just complaining and being worried. And eventually we said, hey, guys, I mean, let's do something about it. I mean, we cannot rely on others to do this. I mean, this is a part. Either we are a part of the problem or a part of the solution. So we decided, okay, let's do this. And we were a little bit worried because we didn't have an experience in, you know, managing organization, in, in budget, in, you know, running all of this operation. We just knew how to do ecology and research. <laughs> but say, we say, well, let's get a group together. So we started to talk to friends, you know, like friends into the conservation world, friends who were like into the business, friends who were really good at media, friends who were really so we accomplished a really diverse group of people with the same interest which is conservation and wildcats and ecosystems but with different skills so we say okay let's do it we have to do it so we started this and we got the backup and the support with as i said from a lot of organizations in in, in costa rica and outside costa rica and we've been working for only two years but we have accomplished oh, wow. a lot in these two years and uh, well this is the this is the proof that it's possible. We just we just have to do it. So how did you do it? I mean, I know that's like <laughs> a very loaded question. Yes. So you have this idea. I'm I don't know if beers were involved or something, and you're just like, <laughs> you know, we should do this. Yes. And so how did you get this idea? And were all of you in like academic researchers? Is that mm -hmm. what your all of your backgrounds are? Okay, mm -hmm. were you working in like a university system or some exactly. sort? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that makes that makes a lot of sense. So that's a big leap from like okay, I'm now supported from a university to doing our own organization. So how did you go from point A to point B? Did you get funding from these other NGOs or did you like? here is my NAMA conservation. Did you start pitching it to other people? How did you do that? I've never done this, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we are not sure either how we did it <laughs> and, or how we're doing it. But so, yes, so we've been into the academic uh, world for a long time. All of us who founded NAMA Conservation are either into uh, finish their PhDs in myself, I'm finishing my PhD. So through all these path, we have known a lot of people related to the conservation world, either professor, other researchers, or even, you know, people from other organizations, because in the places that we work in, we have come across these people. And so through all this time, we've been like, just getting to know each other, but not really interacting. But when we decided to start this organization, we said, okay, all of us know a lot of people in the conservation world and the research world, let's just, you know, reach them 
and tell them about this idea. And so this is how we started to get this, you know, help and just in general, all of us help us in order to, to start. And so, as I said, it's been only two years, but we have done great things in only two years, especially because the COVID situation was in the middle. So we expect to do better and greater things in the future. But you're right. The support from NGOs that really believed in and aligned with the same view that we have has helped us a lot. And so that is the main difference. When you find people in an organization with the same principles and the same objectives than, than you. Are there other Jaguar organizations in Costa Rica or are you the first one? There are, there are some organizations in here that work, you know, but all of them have like different scope, different areas of work and in uh, different, you know, different scopes basically. But yeah, so yeah, there are a few. Okay. Okay. And what exactly are you all doing differently? What's your different spin or how is your mission different? What's the different impact that you all are making? I think the main difference with all different scopes is that we are taking the traditional knowledge, the local knowledge since the beginning. So we're making our plans, we're planning our strategies, we're planning our, our work uh, together with them. And I think that's the main difference. We, we, we like to listen to the people, not just come and tell them what to do. And so if we sit together, we have a plan together, we include their knowledge, we include their, you know, what they think or they believe it should be done. I think it's a better result for everyone. Uh, I've been working in this area in the Osa Peninsula for 10 years. And in 10 years, I have met a lot of people like crucial people like nature guides and local community members and rangers and all of them. So when I go back and try to establish a new research or try to, you know, do new things. I always go to them. I always go and talk to them and, you know, work in collaboration with them because it would be much better to have the, be with them and have their support and do it by myself. Could you take me through an example of a project that maybe Nama is doing right now that brings all of these ideals or pillars of NAMA together? Do you have one that you could take me through? Yeah, well, the main one is the community rangers. So there is an association of community rangers and this is composed of different local members from different communities in the Osa Peninsula who are willing to be volunteers because they don't get paid for this. So they offer themselves to be a volunteer in everything that is needed to, to do monitoring, to do patrol, to do surveillance, to do a lot of things, right? And so, but they, they, don't, they don't have training. They know the area, but they don't have training. And most importantly, they don't have funding. So NAMA has been working on providing training. Next year, we will start. We have done some training virtually because of COVID situation. So we, we got this, you know, training online about these different methods of doing monitoring. But next year, we're starting physically with them, going to the field, teaching them how to set up camera traps, how to do tracking, how to do all these different techniques uh, necessary in order to do monitoring. But also since last year, since two years ago, NAMA was looking for funding with national enterprises in Costa Rica in order to get the money to give it to them. Because as I said, this, it's an association, but they don't depend on any budget. There is no budget actually for them. So all of them volunteer. They put their own uh, vehicles or motorcycles. They pay their own food. And that's really unfair for someone who's actually working and also helping for conservation in their free time. So we got the money in order to do that. So the difference would be for other organization, once they have the money to use them themselves, you know, mm -hmm. like in order to what they consider. And I'm not saying that's not necessary. Sometimes it's necessary. But in this case, it's important for NAMA to trust in the local members. So we funded their activities. They knew what to do. They knew the areas they needed to do. They do their own plan. We just supporting them with travel expenses and some equipment. Oh, that's that's fantastic. So true, like community-based conservation. Like they know okay. what needs to be done. They just maybe not ha didn't have all the resources, which you're like, we will give you the resources. And, oh, that sounds like a win-win. Exactly. And now next year, we're going to start giving them training. So both together, the local members and the researchers are doing the same monitoring, sharing data, 
interpre interpreting the data and publishing together. And not just that, but also spreading the word and getting everyone in the Ulster Peninsula what's going on with the species that we have. And it's not only researchers telling them what's the situation, it's themselves, you know, members of their own communities telling them what is going on with their species, what is the problem, what are the, so the solutions. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. I can't wait till every organization is like NAMA. Just imagine the amazing work that's going to be done when that is the standard versus the outlier. Like I said, it, mm -hmm. it really is starting to be a movement, but it's taking our generation to be more in a place of power where we can start these nonprofits, where we can have a leadership role of some sort in an organization that can make decisions. And I feel like we're finally getting there. Mm -hmm. It's taken a long time. Like I just hit, I just turned 30 this year. And a lot of people are super sad when they turn 30. I'm like, what are you talking about? I <laughs> finally just have it. Exactly. I finally have the number <laughs> to go with. Like, I see, I tr I'm seasoned. I know what I'm talking about. You know, like, it just, I feel like we're finally getting there. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's just a number. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I act like I'm like 24. <laughs> it's fine. I don't care at all, but it's, it's just. It's like I finally am like, hey, I'm 30 now. Respect me. I mean, that's not at all how it works, but you get it. You get it. We're finally moving into a place where we're starting to get that rapport, essentially. Like, it sounds like Nama is starting to have an amazing um, reputation. And I'm sure the local people, they're like, no, we want this organization to work with us, not some other one that in the future might come. They're like, why? What are you doing here? We work with Nama, you know? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> so what is your greater goal for your organization, for NAMA? Okay, first of all, we we started this because we wanted to make a difference uh, with the species that are in danger, which is the top predators, and subsequently to make an effect on the ecosystem. Because as we uh, spoke before, it's important to have the top predators, these keystone species, in order to make sure we have our ecosystem for the future. But we can achieve this, or it's better for us to achieve this if we have the help of everyone, of every stakeholder. So our goal is actually to include every stakeholder necessary to do conservation and just together work. So we're gonna, we want to work just as, a, as an axis in order to have all the different stakeholders working together and facilitate what we want or what we can do better, which is doing research, monitoring, training, bringing the scientific background, but actually just providing a base for the whole stakeholders to sit, sync, and work together. Oh, that's fantastic. I can't wait to see how your organization grows over the next couple of years. I just kind of <laughs> have to like, give me all the updates, Juan. Give me a quarterly update. What are you up to? <laughs> so really fast, I would love for you to talk about this unbelievable jaguar phenomenon that happens in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know they did this until our mutual friend Dave Johnson told me mm -hmm. that he was going to this trip for this phenomenon. I was like, what? Cats do that? T tell me more. So yeah, you briefly mentioned that jaguars hunt sea turtles. Mm -hmm. And that's like mind blowing to anybody mm -hmm. who knows anything about jaguars. Like what, how do they, how do they hunt sea turtles? Could you explain this phenomenon? How and why do they do this? And when is the opportune time? Because they're clearly not going into the ocean to do this. So mm -hmm. explain, what is this? Yeah. So, you know, in the wild, everything is about nature. Uh, every movement that a jaguar does, it would be based on, saving energy or taking energy, you know, like having the advantage of taking a prey or, you know, like saving their lives. In the case of uh, the sea turtles, it's a potential prey. In this phenomenon where jaguars prey on sea turtles happen only in the beaches, as you said, they don't swim and take the, the, adult, the adults on the ocean, or they don't also prey on the eggs, on the nest. Some people believe that they dig out the nest and eat the eggs. No, it's just the adults. And that only happens in places where sea turtle nesting happens at the same time that there is a jaguar population in the forest. So they are they used to back in the day, back in you know like probably two three hundred years ago, probably happened in a lot of places 
in the continent, but now it happens only in a few. And in Costa Rica, we have three places when that happens, one in the Caribbean side and in the Pacific, in the dry forest of Guanacaste and in the Osa Peninsula where we work, these two uh, places. So yeah, it's a, it's a normal thing. It's a regular prey for jaguar. And actually it's really interesting because we have calculated and not even 1% of the adults that come to nest in the beach are affected by this predation. So people shouldn't be worried about jaguars diminishing the population of sea turtles. And let's not forget that the turtles that come to the beach are the females. So the males are not affected either by this. So the proportion of the population who's been taken by jaguars is meaningless. In very, but at the same time, it's very important for the jaguars to count on this because that's what helped them to survive. And it just, you know, it's part of nature, it's part of the food web, and it's a natural behavior. So that's exactly what it happens. A jaguar comes to the beach when there is nesting season. They patrol the beach up and down walking. Whenever they find a turtle, they take it. They take it, they drag it to the forest, and they eat it in there. This is another interesting thing because jaguar is the cat with the strongest bite among all the cats, stronger than lion and tiger. And it's the only one actually that can break the, the shell of a sea turtle. Wow. So this is why pumas don't prey on sea turtles because they don't have a strong bite. They don't have uh, the strongest, you know, as a jaguar. So it's, it's a really intricate relationship that they have, jaguars and sea turtles. And did you, weren't you telling me or like informing me something about phases of the moon? Aren't yes. they like influenced by that? Oh my gosh, please. This is so cool. Explain Yes. That. Yes, so, so sea turtles are really agile and fast and, you know, super fast in animals in the ocean. But once they are on land, they are really slow and, you know, it's harder for them to move. So they select time in the month or in actually months through the year in order to come to nest. So they would select the phases of the moon or actually the time of the month when it's darker because, you know, it's the... It's, it's better conditions for them not to be seen by predators, potential predators, and also with the higher tides. So they have to struggle less in order to be on the land. And so there are special uh, times in the year and during every month, there is a special time in every month. So they choose to come and nest in here. That's so cool. And jaguars know, and they're like, ah. and jaguars, And jaguars know <laughs> that, of course. So Eduardo Carrillo, our mentor, did a really nice study in the 90s, uh, sorry, 98, 2000, in Corcovado National Park. He captured and tagged close to 50 wildly peccaries with radio colors, radio telemetry colors, and also jaguars at the same time. And he found out that jaguars, of course, were after the peccaries, is their main prey. But whenever there was a pick and nesting on the beach, when there were more turtles coming to nest in the beach, Jaguars forgot about peccaries and came down to the ocean, I mean, to the, to the shore, to the coast, and just walked up and down. So whenever sea turtles were nesting, jaguars became nocturnal and then were after the turtles. And then when the nesting was over, they came back to be diurnal and following the peccaries. That's how so do, cool. How do they know, right? Like, <laughs> how... how intelligent and wise these animals are like they know exactly when to go to the beach and look for sea turtles and when there is not peak season there is not nesting they go back to the forest and follow the peccaries and as i said it's all about energy they cannot waste time they cannot waste energy they have to be effective efficient being jowers and it's not like the you know big massive nesting season happens exactly at the same time every year, correct? It might be slightly different for a couple of weeks or something. And so, but somehow these jaguars know when it's happening that year. Exactly. So we're talking about two different behaviors. Like we have this phenomenon that is called arribada in Spanish, where thousands of turtles come to nest, Olive Ridley, not all the species, only the Olive Ridley come to nest like at the same time for three or four days and you can have like thousands and thousands of turtles for like two or three days. And of course, jaguars take these turtles and, you know, because it's a, it's a really nice source of food, but also there are many beaches like the Osa Peninsula when there is no arribada, but there's just constant sea turtles coming to nest. So not, this behavior happens not only in arribadas, but in general, in general, whenever there is a nesting season or nesting 
beaches. Oh, that's so cool. I hope to see this one day. I need to come back and you just need to take me out. Like, okay, Brooke, this is the season you need to come because this is when it's going to happen. And exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> it's really, really amazing to see that. Oh my gosh. Just and just talk about a unique behavior to see in the wild. I mean, I'm all about seeing any cats in the wild and and let alone something like that, where it's like mm-hmm. such a specific, incredible behavior just because they're taking an amazing opportunity and they know that opportunity is there, which is probably taught to them by their mother when they were cubs. Mm-hmm. And it's just so cool. It's just so cool. Mm-hmm. So I would like to make it a little bit of a shift here. You have an amazing mentor in your life that you have brought up multiple times, you know, Eduardo. And I feel like all of us have had some person in our life that was instrumental to our development and who we became. What has Eduardo meant to you? And do you think that you would be in where you are today if you'd never met him? No, definitely not. He was really important in my life. As I said, he became my mentor. And uh, I was I was into mammals. I knew since I was studying biology that that's what I wanted to do, you know. But it was definitely because I met him that changed completely my plans. I mean, I stayed in Costa Rica and that didn't get back to Mexico. Um, so he's really, I consider him like my academic father, you know, like he really took me under his wing, taught me everything he knew, put me in the right direction. Actually, I'm following his steps. He graduated from University of Massachusetts. That's what I'm doing right now, my PhD in, with the same advisor too. Oh, wow. So it's really, I'm following his path. And um, we have a really nice group of of people working together, like two of my colleagues are also under this group of working. So for us, we we talk about it often. And he's like our academic father. Definitely, he taught us everything we know. He put us in the right path. And it would be, our life wouldn't be the same if it wasn't wasn't because of him. Yeah, he sounds like an amazing person. He really does. And yeah, he must have saw something in you or he's like, yeah, I'll take you under my wing, you know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's like, yeah, one, come with me. That's great. I is he a so, part yeah. of NAMA? Is, is he like on the board or anything? Yes, definitely. He's He has to be, you know, <laughs> he had to be part of it. And actually, yeah, he's, he's one of the founders of the organization. Of course, he had to be. Oh, that's fantastic. So, yeah, it's nice to have a leader like that amongst the ranks to help with all of that experience, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, and every time we have some doubts or questions, you know, because we're starting in this conservation world, we often call him and, you know, ask for advice and like, Eduardo, what do you think we should do? You know, like, what, what do we go from here? Where do we go from here? You know, like, what do we do? Yeah. Oh, that's great to have that resource. I'm sure that, I mean, everybody listening, find that person. We, I have that person in my life too, and I'm now working directly with him too, which is amazing to have you know it's amazing to have that that person that you can ask any questions to that can really be your beacon in this really weird conservation world because yes it is odd <laughs> there is no straight yeah. path in any way shape or form you kind of just thrown to the wolves and be like figure it out yeah. okay <laughs> so so on a similar note to that this is also a question i love to ask everybody our journeys are always have up and downs. They have failures and they have some pretty bad struggles at times. Does anything come to mind maybe during your journey that was particularly hard that you had to go through or overcome or maybe even that you're going through right now? What What is something that you've experienced in that sense? Yeah, I think, you know, as, as human beings, we're, we're complex beings. And sometimes as any field, not just conservation, will you come across some people that uh, have different views than you, like probably have different approaches to do, you know, and sometimes organizations as well. But I think we never have to let us down because of that. I think we have to fight for what we believe. We have to believe in us and we have to keep that passion because at the very end, I have noticed that all these people who have created and made 
great progress, like our mentor, like, you know, all these different great people, even the people who created the national parks in Costa Rica, they did it because of passion. They were against everyone pretty much. So I think, as I said, not just in conservation, in any field, you will find negative people, people who are, you know, don't believe in you or simply they have different approaches and and ideas than you, but that's not an impediment that's not a, an obstacle for you to keep pursuing your goals and your dreams and i think you will you will find these kind of people all the time in this situation but you never you never have to lose your passion and your interest in doing that because at the end that's what makes everything possible believing in you believing in your friends and just keep that passion hmm. did you have a particular instance where this happened to you or did it happen recently or anything yeah i mean yeah, yeah. I mean, you you come across uh, certain obstacles always, um, but yeah, specifically working in conservation, you know, there are different, different opinions, different positions, different approaches. So it's been it's been sometimes difficult. But as I said, you have to. I mean, it's annoying, and sometimes it's like you know a little bit difficult to deal with. But we're we're not here for them. We're here for um, the jaguars. We're here for the ecosystems, and we have to keep going. Mm, I love it. I love that. Do you have a particularly crazy or wild story from the field or your research? Oh, I have so many. Oh my God. Okay. Tell me the, (laughs) what's the craziest one? Oof. Well, just one happened to me a few months ago. We were in Nancite in the dry forest. Um, and we watched this, uh, well, we got the opportunity to see a jaguar who was hunting. We were sitting on the beach and the jaguar was walking up and down and we got to see it. We didn't disturb the jaguar. We just stayed there, you know, and the jaguar was looking for, for sea turtles. And eventually he got one, he got a turtle, but midnight. And once he got a turtle, we said, okay, we're going to leave it alone because, you know, it's, it's, it's in its habitat. It's, it's doing jaguar stuff. Mm-hmm. So we went, went back to the station the next morning, very early, I went back to see the turtle. I wanted to see if the turtle had a attack, what species was, said, you know, all those different things. And so I followed the track of the jaguar, the track where he pulled the, the turtle into the forest. At a certain point, the vegetation was so thick that it had to be like, you know, on my belly, just dragging myself into it. And I could see, well, I could see the, the prints of the jaguar coming in there. And we know jaguars stay close to the prey. Sometimes between some meters and 200 meters, but they remain around and they come back the next night to keep feeding. But I was, as I was approaching to the turtle, I heard this huge roar, oh, you God. know, <laughs> coming from the forest because the jaguar was there and it was like a, this deep, deep, you know, low roar that actually moved everything inside me. It was like, <laughs> And I was like, okay, I knew it was going to be close, but not that close. And I didn't see the jaguar. I just, you know, stepped back and I said, okay, I'm not here to take your food. Just I'm out of here. So when we work in the field, we have, you know, these experiences all the time. And sometimes when people go and they say, well, I didn't see any jaguar. I didn't see any wild cat. And I said, well, but you've been walking this forest a lot. And I'm sure the jaguar saw you. And they were like, what? Yeah, because they're everywhere. And the fact that you don't see them doesn't mean they're not there. It's just that they're so well camouflaged and so cryptic and elusive. I tell them all the time, I'm sure the jaguar has seen you. Mm. Oh my gosh, I gave me goosebumps. Like just, even though we love these cats, there is something that's inherently gives you goosebumps when you are near them. And especially if one is giving you a warning like that, mm. like, bro. Exactly. You are too close. Get out of here. Exactly. <laughs> but that's a good thing, you know. Our jaguars oh, yeah. are so polite. Fortunately, because we, you know, if they were like leopards or lions or tigers that they really have encounters with humans all the time, it would be difficult. But no, our pumas or jaguars are really polite. They're very easygoing. They never attack people, and that's great. I was gonna say because I was I spent a lot of time in Nepal towards the beginning of the year. And there's a lot of tiger conflict going on. And when you were telling me that story, if that was a different cat, AKA tiger, that that would have not ended well. <laughs> Just thank God it was a jaguar because that tiger would have been on you like white on rice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. 
<laughs> That's great. I'm glad that you are just fine and it just gave you a warning growl and <laughs> you were able to get out of there safely. Yes. Oh, great. And so next, since you are well in your journey and you have seen things and I'm sure you still will see things, is there any piece of advice or message that you would like to share with anybody listening? Yeah, I think there is one topic in particular that we need to start working on with not only conservationists, but all the people in the world. And that is having jaguars and having keystone species in forests. It's really important for everyone, not only for conservationists, not only for uh, nature guides, you know, not only for ecotourism, but for everyone, even for people that live in cities, even for the regular New Yorker who will never visit the rainforest, having a job where it's important for the lives. But we are being alienated from this knowledge. Like we've been alienated from any relationship with nature. We have lost it. Uh, at a certain point, developing a society in really big cities, we have lost this connection with nature. And I think we have to, everyone has to make an effort in going back and get, get this connection, this bridge you know, between nature and any regular citizen. And I just would like to tell them that having jaguars, having a keystone species in an ecosystem assures that the whole ecosystem works properly. And that is for the Amazon, that is for the rainforest in, in, in Mexico or, or Costa Rica or whatever. And those forests are providing ecological services for everyone in the planet, believe it or not, wanted it or not. And that means clean water, clean air, even medicines to cure our diseases. About a third of the medicines that we use every day come from, for, come from the forest, come from uh, plants and, and, and trees from the rainforest and from the tropical forest in general. So we have to go back and start building that bridge again to connect with nature. And even if someone will never visit the rainforest or the Pantanal, there will be uh, opportunities for them to contribute to conservation, either by donating something or just being friendly with nature, you know, in their everyday lives. Mm, that was so good. <laughs> that was so good. Oh, I could not agree with you more. I mean, I'm such a big advocate for big cats. And because if we have big cats, if we have our wolves, if we have our top predators, then that means that everything below is going to run so well all the way down to water conservation and water security and food security. It's all, if you have a predator there, then you have everything else because they're the first to go when an ecosystem collapses. It's, they can't survive. Exactly. Mm. Well, Juan, you're amazing. And if somebody wants to get in touch with you or mm -hmm. NAMA conservation or, and, or, mm -hmm. and or both, what yes. is the best way for someone to do that? Yeah, so I'm going to give you my email and uh, you can share it with everyone. Also, we are on Facebook with NAMA Conservation. We, are, we have our webpage, namaconservation.org. So you can reach us in there. There are emails in there and phone numbers. You know, you can just contact us for, for everything, for a coming visit, for volunteer, for working with us, doing research, for a beer, anything. <laughs> Especially that last one. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, one, you're amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me today. I can't wait to let everybody learn more about Jaguars in Costa Rica. Thank you very much, Brooke. It was a pleasure. And yeah, come visit soon. <laughs> I absolutely will. There's no question about that. We will, we, will show you the, we will show you the Jaguars. Oh, my God. Everyone listening, you hear that? <laughs> it's happening. Just come with me. We're going. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Thanks, Juan. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>